When I review my life, the privations that I have suffered, the hardships I have endured, the vicissitudes I have passed, and the complete revolution that I have experienced in my manner of living, when I consider my reduction from a civilized to a savage state, and the various steps by which that process has been effected, and that my life has been prolonged, and my health and reason spared, it seems a miracle that I am unable to account for, and is a tragical medley that I hope will never be repeated. The bare loss of liberty is but a mere trifle when compared with the circumstances that necessarily attend, and are inseparably connected with it. It is the recollection of what we once were, of the friends, the home and the pleasures that we have left or lost, the anticipation of misery, the appearance of wretchedness, the anxiety for freedom, the hope of release, the devising of means of escaping, and the vigilance with which we watch our keepers, that constitute the nauseous dregs of the bitter cup of slavery. I am sensible, however, that no one can pass from a state of freedom to that of slavery, and in the last situation rest perfectly contented. But as everyone knows that great exertions of the mind tend directly to debilitate the body, it will appear obvious that we ought, when confined, to exert all our faculties to promote our present comfort, and let future days provide their own sacrifices, in regard to ourselves just as we feel we are. For the preservation of my life to the present time I am indebted to an excellent constitution, with which I have been blessed in as great a degree as any other person. After I arrived at years of understanding, the care of my own health was one of my principal studies, and by avoiding exposures to wet and cold, temperance in eating, abstaining from the use of spirits, and shunning the excesses to which I was frequently exposed, I effected my object beyond what I expected. I have never once been sick till within a year or two, only as I have related. Spirits and tobacco I have never used, and I have never once attended an Indian frolic. When I was taken prisoner, and for some time after that, spirits were not known, and when it was first introduced, it was in small quantities, and used only by the Indians, so it was a long time before the Indian women began to even taste it. After the French War, for a number of years, it was the practice of the Indians of our tribe to send to Niagara, and get two or three kegs of rum, in all six or eight gallons, and hold a frolic as long as it lasted. When the rum was brought to the town, all the Indians collected, and before a drop was drunk, gave all their knives, tomahawks, guns and other instruments of war to one Indian, whose business it was to bury them in a private place, keep them concealed, and remain perfectly sober till the frolic was ended. Having thus divested themselves, they commenced drinking, and continued their frolic till every drop was consumed. If any of them became quarrelsome or got to fighting, those who were sober enough bound them upon the ground, where they were obliged to lie till they got sober, and then were unbound. When the fumes of the spirits had left the company, the sober Indian returned to each of the instruments with which they had entrusted him, and all went home satisfied. A frolic of that kind was held but once a year, and at the time the Indians quit their hunting and came in with their deerskins. In those frolics the women never participated. Soon after the Revolutionary War, however, spirits became common in our tribe, and have been used indiscriminately by both sexes, though there are not so frequent instances of intoxication amongst the squaws as amongst the Indians. To the introduction and use of that baneful article, which has caused such devastation in our tribes, and threatens the extinction of our people, the Indians, I can, with the greatest propriety, impute the whole of my misfortune in losing my three sons, but as I have before observed, not even the love of life will restrain an Indian from sipping the poison that he knows will destroy him. The voice of nature, the rebukes of reason, the advice of parents, the expostulations of friends, and the numerous instances of sudden death, are all insufficient to reclaim an Indian, who has once experienced the exhilarating and inebriating effects of spirits from seeking his grave in the bottom of his bottle. My strength has been great for a woman of my size, otherwise I must long ago have died under the burdens which I was obliged to carry. I learned to carry loads on my back, in a strap placed across my forehead, soon after my captivity, and continue to carry in the same way. Upwards of thirty years ago, with the help of my young children, I backed all the boards that were used about my house from Allen's Mill at the outlet of Silver Lake, a distance of five miles. I have planted, hoed and harvested corn every season but one since I was taken prisoner. Even this present fall, 1823, I have husked my corn and backed it into the house. The first cow that I ever owned, I bought a squaw sometime after the revolution. 
It had been stolen from the enemy. I had owned it but for a few days when it fell into a hole and almost died before we could get it out. After this, the squaw wanted to be recanted, but as I would not give up the cow, I gave her money enough to make, when added to the sum which I paid her at first, thirty-five dollars. Cows were plenty on the Ohio when I lived there, and of good quality. For provisions I have never suffered since I came upon the flats, nor have I ever been in debt to any other hands than my own for the plenty that I have shared. My vices, that have been suspected, have been but few. It was believed for a long time by some of our people that I was a great witch, but they were unable to prove my guilt, and consequently I escaped the certain doom of those who are convicted of that crime, which by Indians is considered as heinous as murder. Some of my children had light brown hair and tolerable fair skin, which used to make some say that I stole them. Yet as I was ever conscious of my own constancy, I never thought that anyone really believed that I was guilty of adultery. I have been the mother of eight children, three of whom are now living, and I have at this time thirty-nine grandchildren and fourteen great-grandchildren, all living in the neighbourhood of Genesee River and at Buffalo. I live in my own house and on my own land with my youngest daughter Polly, who is married to George Chongo and has three children. My daughter Nancy, who is married to Billy Green, lives about eighty rods south of my house and has seven children. My other daughter Betsy is married to John Green, has seven children and resides eighty rods north of my house. Thus situated in the midst of my children, I expect I shall soon leave the world and make room for the rising generation. I feel the weight of years with which I am loaded, and am sensible of my daily failure in seeing, hearing and strength. But my only anxiety is for my family. If my family will live happily, and I can be exempted from trouble while I have to stay, I feel as though I could lay down in peace a life that has been checked in almost every hour, with troubles of a deeper dye than are commonly experienced by mortals.'